Now, when, when, uh, as a female, when I go to my doctor, I say, these are the symptoms that I might be in, encountering. And you're honest with your doctor, and your doctor gives you the information that's been given to him or her by the manufacturer. When they are promoting these particular products um, to help resolve the issues you're reporting to them, they're only as good as the information that's been funneled to them. Manufacturers in this country have a duty to fully disclose what's going on to the to the doctor, the, the implanting doctor, your OBGYN, uh, your general practice doctor, they have an obligation to let them know. Um, the way that medical devices and drugs work is a manufacturer sends a person that's called a sales representative to the doctor and they're basically promoting these newer devices. Um, and we want them to be innovative, but not to the degree that we are being harmed by it without our own understanding. So if I were to go into the doctor the way I understood with transvaginal mesh, um, I would be told by the doctor before some of these changes have recently taken place, which we'll get into, that um, my symptoms could be corrected easily with a minimal surgery, mm -hmm. outpatient surgery, um, in the doctor's office, minimal bleeding, and that the benefits would be wonderful. Everything would be taken care of within a very short time period uh, by using one of these products that we're going to talk about, uh, the TransMesh or the POP. Um, uh, type devices. Uh, what actually ended up happening? Can you go through and tell our viewers what actually ended up happening when these, again, when I'm making the uh, risk assumption, I'm making the risk benefit assumption, is this something that is worth it to me to be able to go in and have this minimal procedure performed, or so I think, um, and, and get this wonderful result, I'm going to make the decision to have this fairly easy procedure. But that's not exactly what ended up happening, is it? That's correct. What happens is the doctors present these ideas, these surgical techniques as, as innovative procedures that are they're less invasive and the side effects are, are minimal to none. But as you pointed out earlier, the doctors are passing on information that they're given. And the doctors, just like, just like the public, is presuming that these manufacturers have done their safety tests, they've done their studies, they've done their diligence, which in reality they've not. What's happened is that there are literally Kim, dozens of these products that are put out onto the market, and some of them are arguably safe statistically, but so many of them through this clearance process, they've piggybacked one off of the other, and now you just have dozens of products out on the market. What's happened recently is that the FDA has come out and said, wait a minute, these products need more studies because we don't have enough data out there. Now that we've pumped out dozens of these products, there's not enough data to support the adverse events that are out there. It just isn't lining up. So they're making these manufacturers go back and study these products. And what the manufacturers are doing is they're not studying them, they're taking them off the market. They're taking them off the market because they're they're not safe. They're well, not effective. You've covered you know quite a few um, terms, and I just want to make sure that our viewers are understanding sort of the process. And I think early on you had talked about a 510k and and things that the FDA, because a lot of people uh, presume, hey, the FDA approved it, it's safe to go forward. The FDA's function is to take on the information that's provided to them by the manufacturers and yes, evaluate it. But in most instances, because of the um, desire to put out these innovative um, devices and drugs and such, um, there have been uh, procedures put in place by the FDA so that things can kind of move through a little quicker, uh, move through the process. If a manufacturer is uh, suggesting that their device is similar to or almost identical to a device that had already been on the market for a while. That is what Robert's talking about when he mentions a, a rapid approval rate. So we get a drug or a device on the market through this um, process through the FDA, and what happens then is sort of um, the adverse events that he referenced. Uh, once a product is out on the market, people start using the product, then you have your real world and, and, you know, I think sometimes manufacturers might look at us as guinea pigs, but you have your real world users and consumers who are the people that are putting these drugs and devices oftentimes to the test. It's not as though there's been an extensive, in, in some instances, it's only six weeks worth of testing before a drug or device gets on the market, um, sometimes longer, sometimes less, of course. But, um, you know, once that drug gets on the market, then your doctors and then consumers start making these adverse event reports 
back to the FDA, back to the manufacturer, back to the doctor. And as these adverse event reports start coming in, then people start to wake up and listen and say, hey, wait a minute, um, you know, something's going on with this. Now, as, as attorneys, we don't just necessarily go out and, and sue people because a product doesn't work. We, we fully understand that um, not every single device is completely um, preventable against some type of failure. We understand that devices and drugs and, you know, these are practicing medicines. This is things that are innovative. We've got some very severe conditions that require these new innovative drugs and people would do almost anything to uh, do uh, and, and test these things so that we can find cures and so that we can move forward. When we start taking and looking at these lawsuits in these, these particular cases, it's because we know that a manufacturer did not do due diligence mm -hmm. or we know that a manufacturer did not research or they found information that they omitted from things that were submitted to the FDA, or we find things that were manipulated before it went to the FDA. Tell us what is the um, situation with regard to these uh, slings and such that have brought this to a lawsuit or have met the threshold of, hey, we need to hold these manufacturers accountable. Why is it, why is it that we're going after these people? Well, and Kim, you mentioned the slings too. If I could show uh, picture D, just to show the audience a, a depiction. Now, this is a little bit different than the device that I showed just a few minutes beforehand. This is what you reference as a sling, and this is what corrects stress urinary incontinence in women. And what has happened, and if you could show up picture F, Picture F is, is what's called the family tree of mesh products. Down here at the bottom, see those yellow boxes? Those are the sling devices. And what's happened is that each one of them has sort of built off and cleared off of each other until you get to the red boxes up at the top. And those are the pelvic organ prolapse kits. So what, what? this what this illustrates is that these devices, they aren't being studied. They're just sort of what we call piggyback off of each other. And that's what's created this storm by the FDA is that they're starting to realize that these products aren't being studied all along. They're just being piggybacked and piggybacked. And now we have a bunch of what you, what you call adverse events where people are getting hurt and they're having complications and they're reporting it. And now the FDA is looking back and they're saying, well, how did these products come on? And oh, wait a minute, especially the red boxes, these pelvic organ prolapse kits, wait a minute, these need more studies. These need to be tested some more before you can put them out on the market anymore. What was the earliest, um, I guess, when was it that we first found a device or a procedure that would help um, help this, this situation? What was the earliest date for that? The earliest date that a synthetic sling came onto the market was in the late 1990s. 1998 really was the inception of the first real sling kit. And then this stayed on the market for a while. And for the most part, at least statistically, it was, it was held by doctors as somewhat of a success and therapeutic and helpful. And then in 2004, those bigger pieces of mesh, those pelvic organ prolapse kits came out. And what was illustrated on that tree is that they came out of the market by predicating themselves off of slings. And I think anyone can look at those pictures and, and tell that a large piece of prolapse mesh and a small strip of, of sling mesh is very different. Mm -hmm. But they weren't cleared that way. They were cleared as if they were just alike and they were just put out on the market. So what, what are the problems that women are seeing with, with the prolapse kits, I guess? Um, well, let me back up. Why was there a need for a prolapse kit? Was a what is it? A, was it a product of uh, manufacturers wanting to increase their sales and marketing, or was it there is actually a need for something different than the slings because the slings just aren't working well enough for women? Um, what was the what was the sort of catapulting factor? The the catapulting factor, and this can be seen mostly statistically from doctors, the catapulting factor was a perceived need that, that wasn't really there, at least for the prolapse kits, because there are a couple of different surgical options besides the prolapse kits. So women, if you're going to your doctor and, your doc and you have prolapse of some degree, and the doctor says, well, we're gonna put in this mesh, it, it would be very wise to say, well, doctor, what, what are my other options? Because there likely will be other options. And you can see with the statistics, the manufacturers are the ones that actually created this need because they saw a market there. 
and for a while around the hype was usually uh, it was right around 2008 2009 doctors were putting these things in after they'd been on the market and then the doctors were saying hey my patients they keep coming back in here the, the, these things are problems what's going on and then after 2009 you saw another dip where doctors actually stopped using them they stopped using them because of all the problems that were going on